Hi, this is Medcuter Berry, and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be doing a quick overview of innate immunity. So let's get started. What are the six qualities of my immune system, of our immune system? First, it should be able to differentiate self versus non-self, so we don't cause injury to our own cells. Second, it needs to have some sort of memory. Third, it should be able to tell between intracellular versus extracellular organisms. Intracellular are viruses, bacteria can be both. Also, it should be able to distinguish between microscopic versus macroscopic organisms like parasites from bacteria. And then five, specificity. The more specific it is, the more specific killing mechanisms we're gonna have against the pathogen. And the last is proliferation. Proliferation is that in times of need, my cells um, or the killing cells are able to proliferate and divide, and we can have a lot more cells to help us get rid of the infection. So moving on, we're going to see a big overview of the innate immune system. We have um, the big thing that we're gonna use in innate immunity, or like the frontline kind of warriors, are my complements. And complements, um, the big one you want to remember is C3, okay? And we'll get into all of this in just a second, but let's just talk about our complements to begin with. So complements um, are the present in the blood. They can be activated, they can be cleaved. Remember that there's three different pathways to turn on complements. There is an alternative pathway, which we're gonna see in the innate immune system. There's the lectin pathway, which we're also going to see in innate immunity. And then there's a the classical pathway, which actually needs antibodies to turn on, and antibodies are only seen in adaptive immune system, so this is something we're gonna discuss in another video on the adaptive immune system. So my alternative and lectin pathway are the ones that we're gonna be talking about um, for the innate immune system. Remember that all of these different pathways converge at complement five. What does complement five do? Complement five cleaves into C5A and C5B, C5B goes on to form a complex with C6, C7, C8, C9, and together they do this thing called a MAC attack. A MAC attack, uh, it simply involves um, these complements forming pores in the cell membranes of the bacteria. When you form pores, you cause osmotic damage and you kill the bacteria. So moving on uh, back to our flowchart, let's say, um, there has been a breach in the skin and a bacteria enters in my blood. The first thing that's gonna identify the bacteria is my complement three or C3. C3 is then going to be cleaved into C3A and C3B and we're gonna talk about what they do in the next slides. So this just um, is a repetition of what I said. The bacteria enters the skin Complement C3 is activated, our alternative pathway is triggered, and it splits into C3A and C3B. And now C3A and C3B both have different functions, and we're going to talk about them in a quick second. So let's start with C3A. C3A has two big functions. First, causing inflammation by degranulation of mast cells. And second, some amount of early chemotaxis, and we're going to talk about it in the next slide. So C3A, right, inflammation um, is what we use to describe the four classical signs of inflammation, which are edema, swelling, redness, and pain, okay? Um, inflammation is caused when mast cells release histamine. So our C3A activates mast cells. It degranulates the mast cells, which releases a lot of histamine at the site of the infection and that causes our inflammation or the four classical signs of inflammation at the site of our infection. The other thing C3A does is this thing called chemotaxis, and I have this written down here, initial chemotaxis. So chemotaxis, just think of C3A as being like a loudspeaker and just be like, hey guys, like there's something here, come this way. So it's just like a little loudspeaker that's like calling everyone to the site of inf inflammation. Um, and that's what chemotaxis really means, really means. So that's something that C3A does. Moving on to what C3B does. C3B, so sorry, going back to this slide, C3B does two different things. 
First, it can go down to form C to forming C5, which is going to then do that MAC attack with the pore forming complex. And second, it can cause opsonization, which is something we'll discuss second. Let's talk about how C3B is going to go and do the MAC attack. So this is where we are. C3B um, is cleaved by factor B. Factor B is what is cleaved by factor D, just information in case you want to remember. But C3B is cleaved to form C3B, BB, which is also called a C3 convertase. C3 convertase is stabilized by properdin, which is another little detail um, if you want, would like to remember. Now C3B or C3 convertase uh, is then converted to C5 convertase and C5 convertase is then split one more time to form C5A and C5B. C5A, like C3A, does initial chemotaxis with inflammation. C5B, on the other hand, comes together with complement C6, C7, C8, C9, and does our MAC attack. And um, we already discussed what a MAC attack is. It causes bacterial lysis by forming pores in the membrane of the bacteria. Another thing that C3B can do is this thing called opsonization. Opsonization is simply making the bacteria more tasty or more appetizing for my macrophages and my neutrophils to come and eat them, right? So think of C3B just like adding a, a whole lot of mayo or a whole lot of ketchup to your sandwich, which makes it more tasty, and then you know the macrophages and neutrophils would like to come eat them. So let's look at this. What happens when you opsonize, and how are the macrophages and the neutrophils going to kill? So the macrophages and the neutrophils are going to come to eat that tasty sandwich, and they're going to phagocytose uh, my bacteria. Okay, um, they are going to initially bind to those C3B receptors to kind of you know hook on to the bacteria, and then they're going to um, phagocytose them and try to eat them. Neutrophils kill by a mechanism called oxidative burst. What happens in an oxidative burst is that neutrophils release their um, oxidative enzymes out on the bacteria, which causes the death of the bacteria, but also the neutrophil dies in the process. Okay, And they can also release these things called nets. So what this does is when a neutrophil ties, tries to eat, eat up bacteria, it ends up leaving a lot of debris, and that's what the pus that we see is it's basically neutrophils that tried to get rid of the, that bacteria. Macrophages, on the other hand, um, do something a little bit different. Macrophages can also release some cytokines. So let's let's see what cytokines are. When macrophages get close or get near the bacteria, the first thing they do is try to recognize what kind of bacteria are we looking at. So there's this thing called toll-like receptors on the macrophage that bind to certain um, PAMPs on the bacteria, which are just basically signals. Let me show you a picture first and then we'll come back. So these are my toll-like receptors that are on my macrophage, okay? These macrophages can bind to specific PAMPs or PRRs, um, uh, sorry, specific PAMPs on the bacteria for example, if the bacteria is gram um, negative and has LPS in its cell membrane, that's going to turn on my DLR4. If the bacteria has a flagella, that can turn on my DLR5. If the bacteria is gram positive, has a lot of peptidoglycan, it can turn on my DLR2. So based on what kind of bacteria it is, these DLRs can help us identify the bacteria, the more specific um, our immune system gets, remember, the more specific the killing can be. So once the DLRs have bound the PAMPs on the bacteria, there can be, there can be intracellular signaling. Okay? There can be intracellular signaling, which turns on certain downstream signaling processes, which eventually will turn on receptors, uh, will turn on genes coding for cytokines. 
cytokines are molecules that will help us fight infection. Okay, so cytokines um, that we can get from a macrophage in the innate immune system are these five that have been mentioned here. We get IL-6, IL-1, DNF-alpha, which are our primary inflammatory cytokines. We also get IL-8, which is our primary chemokine, which is the one that's going to act like a loudspeaker and then call everyone to the site of infection. And then we can also get IL-12, which is more important um, usually with viruses or when we have to interact with NK cells, which is something we're going to talk about in the adaptive community. So just to summarize, macrophages have toll-like receptors on them that can bind to the PAMPs on the bacteria that can help them um, recognize the, the type of bacteria that's causing the infection. Remember that these toll-like receptors can not only identify bacteria, but they also have the capacity to identify certain viruses. Because some toll-like receptors are intracellular receptors, some are extracellular. Viruses tend to be intracellular, so intracellular receptors can help us detect the kind of viruses as well. So toll-like receptors then go on to do intracellular signaling using things like JAK-STAT and then NF-kappa B as a transcription factor, which can turn on certain cytokine receptor genes, which will eventually give us our five big cytokines that we see in our immune system. IL-6, IL-1, TNF-alpha, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-8 as a chemokine, and IL-12 um, that is used to interact with NK cells. So hopefully that is clear. So my last question is, can macrophages also help us make some anti-inflammatory cytokines? And the answer to this is yes. So IL-10 and TGF-beta are um, anti-inflammatory cytokines, which help suppress the immune system. And um, I apologize that for the smiley, um, it's a sad smiley, but remember, anti-inflammation, inflammatory cytokines are also good. Okay, they're good and bad. Um, so include a happy face here. It just depends on the, the situation that we're looking at. Um, and that's everything for this video, and I will see you again in the video for adaptive immunity. Hope this helps. Thank you, guys.